way back in the back. So Mariah tells me that there are different Joshes. I'm not talking about like, I knew a guy in my high school who was named Josh Donahoe or Josh Robinson or, you know, different versions of me. So you've got normal Josh. This is the Josh that you all know and love very dearly. Um, but there's also a chef Josh. Apparently when I get in the kitchen, things change a lot. I'm supposed to be dumping milk or flour into a sauce that she's making and, and then somehow I, I start sprouting more arms and I'm grabbing spices and I'm, have you put this in there yet? Have you put this? Uh, oh, maybe you should cut that a little different. <laughs> like, apparently I'm a culinary snob in the kitchen. But there's also Hungry Josh. Now, a lot of people change whenever they get hungry. You know, they might get a little impatient or a little grumpy. But normal Josh is a, um, a reasonably responsible driver. Hungry Josh makes daring decisions that make Fast and Furious look like uh, they're using golf carts. <laughs> you know, you sometimes have to cut across three lanes of traffic in order to get to the Mexican restaurant. You just decided you're going to. <laughs> There's instruction Josh. So if you ever play a new board game with me, you'll probably meet Instruction Josh. He gets a, he gets louder, but not in a yelling way, but like a very stern, like these are the rules. Very stern. Um, I feel like there was something else about Instruction. Matter of fact. That's how she <laughs> describes that Josh. Matter of fact. This is the way we play. <laughs> And then the one Josh that is probably beyond words, Mariah said you just have to experience it, is gum Josh. <laughs> Apparently when I chew gum, I turn into a totally different person. <laughs> and it is, it is beyond words. <laughs> I don't know, but... I don't even know what to tell you. <laughs> Something about gum, I guess. Everyone's gonna be offering you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So our question today is, was God different in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament? Was there a gum God, if you will? Was God more hostile in the Old Testament but then you look at Jesus, and you don't see much hostility. And so, in a previous sermon, I had talked about how God does not change. That was the God is series. God, God is infinite. God is unchanging. God uh, is outside of time. Those sermons. So why is it that if God doesn't change, he looks so different in the context of the Old Testament or the New Testament? So let's turn, we, we sh you should be at 2 Peter, um, we're going to be in chapter 3 today, starting at verse 2, and then we'll skip to verse 9. Now you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the command of the Lord and Savior through, the, through your apostles. So right there, Peter is saying that throughout the Old Testament, the prophets continuing through the life of Jesus and through the apostles, God has had one string of thought. And I really wanted to make that point. But skip to 9 now. 9 through 13. Oh wait, actually I'm going to explain what happens between 2 and 9 for you. So, Peter then lists out a lot of things. And this is the Peter that you know from the Gospels. He's writing to a church. And he's saying... There was creation that took place. There was the flood. There is fire being stored up for a day of judgment. Even though scoffers, critics say, oh, 
you know, the world just keeps turning. It was turning a thousand years ago, it was turning today, it'll be turning a thousand years from now. You know, the world just keeps going on as it always has. So why are you trying to tell me that one day things are going to change? That Jesus is going to come back? And Peter is warning them, don't listen. Because look at it, creation was a change. Before, it was God in heaven. And then suddenly there was earth. There was everything we know. And then there was another change. Man, flood. There were billions of people that were killed in the flood. And then there was eight people on earth. Talk about a change. And he's saying that one day, in the same way but different, it won't be a flood, it will be a fire. That the population of the earth will be wiped out. But there will be some saved through water. And he talks about baptism. But then he gets to eight. Or sorry, he gets to nine. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. So that would be like the stars, not angels. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you be in life? Yeah, sorry. What sort of people ought you to be in life? In lives of holiness? Man, I am struggling. Basically, you should be holy and godly because there will come a day. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I wasn't just going to leave you with the fire. I was going to give you what's, what comes afterwards. So this has spelled out that even though God manifests himself differently at different times, there is a continuous plan that God has been revealing over time. So our first point is that God is more merciful in the Old Testament than we think. Now the Old Testament, if you exclude Genesis, so Genesis ends with the life of Joseph. And then we pick up with Moses. From Moses to Jesus is about 1,600 years. Moses to creation, probably somewhere around uh, 2,400 years. So we're talking about 4,000 years in the Old Testament. And then we've got the life of Jesus. And the well-documented part is only three years. There's not a whole lot. I think God, in the short term, is very forgiving. And we see that in the life of Jesus. You know, you, you see how he's harsh with the closed-minded, self-righteous church people. The Old Testament shows God's, God's ultimately playing for the long game. So we think about cities like Sodom and Gomorrah that are completely wiped out, right? And we say, God, how can God destroy entire cities with a whim? The whole city of Sodom, the whole city of Gomorrah. And the only people that got out were Lot, his wife who was turned into a pillar of salt, and then his two daughters. But before that, Lot's uncle, Abraham, 
got to meet with God and a couple of angels. And God said, well, you know, we're going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of all the evil that has taken place. And Abraham, he decided to haggle with God. He said, if I can find 50 people, 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? Well, yeah, if you can find 50. And I read the whole story, and man, it goes on for like 15, 20 verses of Abraham. Oh, okay, 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 God. 45. 45 people, 45 righteous people. Would you destroy the whole city if 45 righteous people lived in there? No, if you can find 45. As this had to go on for at least 25 minutes. So he ends up saying, if you can find 10 righteous people, I will not destroy the city. 10. That would be like saying, you go to you go to Belleville, O'Fallon, that general metro east area, and say, if you can find ten righteous people in all of the metro east, I will not destroy O'Fallon and Belleville. Ten. And then it cuts to the angels appear in in uh, at Lot's door, and Lot lets them in. And then the wicked people of the city start banging on Lot's door. Hey, we saw you got two people in there. Bring them out here. And they're drunk and they're just filled with wickedness. No telling what they're wanting to do. And Lot says, no, 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 no. They're going to stay inside. But I can bring my, my daughters out to you. If, if you want to do with them whatever you want, just leave these two people. And this is the city we're talking about. You know, the level of unrighteousness that was taking place in these places. But even more so, God said, if you can find ten good people, I won't destroy them. And then he lets Lot and his daughters leave. Because those were the only good people there. And I think we're talking about good on a spectrum. This isn't even necessary, like not even close to Christ. But then there's other stories like Jericho, the walls of Jericho. But if you think about it, for the people of Jericho, that would have been terrifying. And then they're killed. Joshua takes all of the Israelites that Moses has been leading through the wilderness for 40 years, and they come up to these walls of Jericho, and they walk around it seven times, and then the walls fall down, and they go in, and God said, don't leave a single person in all of the land of Canaan. Not a woman, not a child, not a donkey. Wipe them out. And you think, gosh, Josh, not sorry, uh, not Joshua, uh, God is telling Joshua to commit genocide. How can I believe in a God that wants genocide to happen? But he said to Abraham, probably about 600 years earlier, your descendants are going to be sojourners, travelers, and then they will come to a land and I am I'm going to wait for 400 years and wait for them to have the iniquities at their fullest level. So whatever that means, whatever sin at its fullest level means. But the people in, in the land of the Canaanites performed painful child sacrifices to their false gods. We're talking about bad stuff. Not just, well, you know, yeah, they had a 20% crime rate. This was just widespread terrible behavior. And God wanted to protect the Israelites from the corruption that would be brought in 
from the, the surrounding cultures. But he waited. You know, he waited. He said, I'm going to give them 600 years. He said, he said 400, but then it ended up being about 600. 600 years. That'd be, you know, if someone said to me, Josh, your life isn't right. But I'm going to give you 600 years before I pronounce any judgment on you. I have some time, everybody. <laughs> I got time, you know? 600 years, that is a lot of generations to change. God, in the Old Testament, at least 10 different times, 10 different times. I think I have a scripture on there, Billy. 10 different times. This is what the Jews say about him. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I put uh, six references on the screen, but there's even more. This was a common saying in the Israelite culture. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Israelites did not think of God as an unmerciful, righteous, wrathful being that is just waiting to slaughter entire nations. In fact, he used other nations to try to correct Israel. There was the Egyptian slavery, the Babylonian slavery, the uh, Assyrian slavery. All of these things. God was working together for the good of his people. And we know that, Romans 8.28, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes, he works all things together for the good. So God was more merciful in the Old Testament than we think. Our second point today, things have changed from the Old Testament, right? Lots of things have changed. Today, we are currently living in a special window of salvation. So I will tell you, the way that God operates, deals with us, has changed. But God is still the same God. And I'm glad to be alive right now. So now, like never before, before there were priests there were sacrifices, sometimes daily. There were rituals. There was so many different things that the people of God had to do in order to be able to come to God. And they didn't even get to come to God. They had to go to a priest. Today, our priest is in heaven. Sitting at the right hand of God. And we get to talk to Jesus. And we get to talk to God openly. And the often forgotten God, the Holy Spirit, is dwelling in each of us. And we, I don't think, it's like, you know, your birthday. Sadie, do you feel older today? Exactly. We don't necessarily feel the Holy Spirit all the time. We don't know how much aid he is giving us. But if we look at society today, Versus society in the days of Moses, I think it is definitely uh, obvious how much the Holy Spirit has helped humanity. Back then, it was like, how can we inflict the most pain possible? Oh, I got it. Why don't we attach blades to the side of our chariots so that way we can just drive through people and kill them? I'm not joking. The Assyrians were probably known as some of the most brutal warfare societies that there has ever been in the history of the world. And that was something that they did. Today, we have global laws on how uh, warfare should be conducted. The Geneva Con Convention. They said, oh, you can't have a blade that is triangular. Because that inflicts a wound that won't heal properly. 
Now you're like, Josh, you really attribute that to the Holy Spirit? I do. You see, at the, at the, at the time of Christ and following, orphanages popping up. The first public hospitals that were available to anyone. Just show up. Yeah, you pay, but at least you have a hospital that you can go to. Before, they were just private hospitals or private doctors. We, we get universities. We get a family structure that is no longer just a domineering, uh, abusive father and a mother that gets no opinion and kids that are raised in harshness. The Christian family ideal is that it says a, a father should not be harsh with his children. A husband should lay down his life for his bride like Christ did. A wife should respect her husband like the church respects Christ. And this is not put it, this is this is hopefully uh, executed properly, making the family structure stronger. These were not things that were common before the Holy Spirit. Even treating people the way you want to be treated. That came from the Bible. Now, as much as I would like to talk about how this window is incredibly special, I say, do not wait for this window to close. And that is our third point. That God operates differently in the Old Testament and the New Testament because of the relationship with Christ. But there will come a time, Second Peter said, they'll come like a thief. God's judgment will not be merciful after this window is closed. You hear people saying, and this is, this, Peter, if you read all of three, he talks about the scoffers. I think in our day, it's not so much as scoffers, but people that say, you know, I'll get myself right with God someday. You know, can't you hear just your, the people that you spend time with saying that? If, you, if they don't know the Lord, I'll get right with them one day, you know? Like we have some sort of guarantee that you'll have at least five more years. Or that, you know what, you're going to get to save the date in the mail. And that's when Jesus is coming back. So as long as you get right before that, you're fine, you know? But if you read Revelation, you see the return of the Old Testament. You see plagues happen. You see the horsemen of the apocalypse. Man. If your title is a horseman of the apocalypse, that is not someone you invite to a birthday party. Not, not much mercy is seen in Revelation. Except for those who took the opportunity when it was given. Now I was talking to Ryan last night, and she was like, okay, so, you know, kind of give me a run through your sermon. And I said, I got to my last point, and I said, okay. You know, I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know whenever your parent, when your mom would say, you wait until your dad gets home. And you know what that means. Your father's judgment is going to be rendered when your dad gets home. <laughs> Usually with some sort of implement, like a belt. The New Testament is saying, don't wait until your father comes home. We're giving, we're giving you instruction. We're giving you 
what you need right now. Don't delay. Act now for $19.99. <laughs> Don't delay, you know? But it is so important to take the time we have because we aren't guaranteed tomorrow. James talks about, you know, you make plans for the future. And I'm all for making plans. I love making plans. I'm a plan maker fool, even if I don't check all my boxes off. There's a plan. But James says, be careful making plans tomorrow because you don't know you will have them. Say, if God's willing, I'll check on my boxes tomorrow. Just to be mindful that reminding ourselves today is all we have. We know we've got today. And Peter says, we ought to live godly and holy lives while we have them. The problem is that people think, well, I'm a good person. God won't judge me too harshly if I'm a good person. Peter says, live holy and good lives, basically. But we can't outweigh everything in the past. We can't really even outweigh everything we do today with the goodness. And that's why it is so important that we accept Jesus. And then whenever you accept Jesus as your Savior, it isn't about performance. It's like Mariah. Me and Mariah. We want to do things because we love the other person. I don't say, well, you know, I'm going to look away whenever this uh, half-naked lady shows up on the screen because I want you to know I'm a good husband. But because I love my wife and I want her to know that I think she is beautiful and I'm saving myself for her. Oh, I'm gonna check my phone. Oh, I'm gonna glance away. You know, oh, is someone robbing us in the dining room even though I'm in the living room? Well, okay, well, commercial's over, so it's all right. You do things out of love. And when Jesus, when you, this is, I said last week, tell yourself the gospel every day. Because that is whenever we let it pervade every part of our life. We are healthy. But also, whenever we tell ourselves the gospel every day, we're reminded that Jesus loved me enough that he died. And I'm not going to take that sacrifice lightly. Now I'm going to do my best to live up to the sacrifice he did. Because there's a reward later. But he also when we think about the gospel we should think about the end of the gospel. One day, we will be in heaven with him. And so really, it puts things into perspective. That a sacrifice, a small sacrifice today, is really not that big of a sacrifice in eternity. Because good and evil, we will not fight this battle for long. Good and evil are not eternal. There is good and there is the punishment. And that's the only things that are going to be eternal. And I hope, I pray, that you and I will live in a way that God says, 
you did well, my good and faithful servant. And not, I never knew you. So let's go ahead and continue to our discussion time.